it's such a beautiful city. Um, it's a lot smaller than Los Angeles, I guess. Alberto said that uh, the region, I think the total, the entire region has like one million people, right? Something yeah. like that. Half a million. Uh, half a million. Okay. Yeah. Los Angeles just itself is something like 11 million if you count the whole <laughs> county, the, just the, uh, the county of Los Angeles. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's very beautiful here. Uh, so today, so you know, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, Western U.S. water resources and specifically focus in on Southern California and our water supply there. But I think the, um, you know, this, when, you, when I'm presenting, you can think of this work as it applies to uh, the Dolomite region here, and because uh, I think we have a lot of similarities. We have a fairly similar climate. They say we have a Mediterranean climate. Um, I think the climate is, from, compared to Los Angeles, is very different than it is here. We don't have the humidity that you have in, in, in the summertime, but, um, but we do have a Mediterranean climate, as, as people like to call it. But we also have these mountains. Our, most of our stream flow comes from snowpack, and, but we also have very um, important water resources issue, issues in Los Angeles, that being an arid region, which maybe you don't have that. I think the Adige River is the second largest in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, but maybe if we're thinking about Sicily or Puglia or Calabria or something like that, they, they have certainly water resources issues down there with their arid climate. Um, so before moving on, just to acknowledge the co-authors here, Brianna Pagan, she was a student of mine who now is at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And so she really led this work. This is actually coming from her master's thesis. So really I'm presenting her master's thesis today. Motus Ashvak is a former student who's led the uh, the Oak Ridge National Labs team in Tennessee, uh, and then some of his students and collaborators there. Um, so before we go on, uh, I just want to give you a schematic of how the Western United States water cycle works. Okay, and so we use what's called a water year, so different than a calendar year. By the way, if I speak too quickly or not clearly, please interrupt and, and just tell me if you don't understand or you know, be informal, it's fine. Um, our water year, we define as October 1st to September 30th, okay? So, so this year, this calendar starts on October 1st, and the reason being is essentially due to the precipitation. Our precipitation, we have a, uh, our precipitation falls mostly in the winter time in, in the Western United States. So we get our precipitation then. Fortunately, we have um, uh, snowpack, natural reservoirs that store our precipitation until later on in the springtime when it melts. And about 75% of our annual stream flow in California it comes from snow melt. So it's from these the snowpack in the mountains, the Sierra Nevada the mountains that we have there, and also the Rocky Mountains. Um, and then if we think about when we need the water, I think you can imagine that we need the water mostly in the summertime. It's a very s simple picture here. Um, we have a very, very complex water resources system uh, in place, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, about some of these aqueducts that we have. Um, and these red reservoirs, the yeah, whole idea, is that I think most of you know, is really to store water when, we, when it's in abundance and, and to release it when we um, need it. We also have very large reservoirs. So you can think of the Colorado River. Maybe, maybe some of you have heard of Lake Mead, Lake Powell. These very large, large reservoirs that can get us through very long, multi-year droughts. In fact, in Los Angeles, in Southern California, actually all of California, we suffered a very long drought that I think made international headlines um, for the last several years. And we just came out of the, most of the state came out of the drought uh, with this last year's precipitation. And, um, and one thing that's very important to note is that our reservoirs, in fact, our federal mandate requires that our reservoirs uh, release what our, our number one use of our reservoirs is for flood control. So we have to, in this winter time, when we get all our precipitation in the winter time, we actually have to release water from the reservoirs so that we can use them for flood control purposes. Okay. And so when we're thinking about the climate change and the impacts on, on snowpack and things like that, we have to think about these sort of uh, these rule curves for the, uh, for the reservoirs. And so the, the whole point really of the study is to look at the climate change impacts on Western uh, uh, U.S. hydrology. And it's really, this is really, um, I guess part of the question that we want to address is, is our 20th century infrastructure, all these aqueducts, all these uh, reservoirs, is that resilient or is that really uh, ready for 21st century climate? Yeah. 
And another note just to mention is that if you think of population distribution in California, about 75% of the precipitation occurs in the north of California, yet 75% of the uh, um, population lives in the south. Okay, so we have this issue of just moving water around, which is very, very important. Okay. Um, let's go a little bit more into where we get our water. Um, I just found this on Wiki Wikipedia, and uh, the California hosts the uh, world's largest, most productive, and most controversial water system in the world. I think that's not really new news. I think we know that, at least uh, I do. And, uh, and I um, put these hopefully in the right uh, metric units. We have 49 uh, cubic kilometers per year. That's the amount of water that we're moving around and serving about 30 million people and uh, 2.3 million hectares of irrigation. Okay. And this is just a picture of, our, of our, some of our aqueducts here. We, and the ones we'll be focusing on is down, down here with the Colorado River Aqueduct the Owens Valley, Los Angeles aqueduct, and then the California aqueduct here, but we, there's lots of aqueducts throughout the state that are just moving water around to different locations. And uh, to, sh to talk about, we're really, like I said, we're going to focus in, we're talking about the western U.S., but we're going to focus in in the Southern California region here, Los Angeles, San Diego, and with Orange County in between there. Um, and so we do have some local supplies there, and uh, interesting how, how it, these local, these are very controversial, it's a very, very controversial topic in, in Los Angeles. Water agencies don't even like to give out data because of uh, you know, the types, types of things that go on with water. But we have our local local groundwater supply. We also recycle water with advanced treated water that even goes through membranes uh, that we could uh, we could potentially drink. We cannot drink now, it's, it's against the law. But they use it for watering golf courses or retrie uh, recharging aquifers. And we have conservation, which is actually considered, uh, interestingly enough, it's a, it's a local source. So we've reduced our water use by, say, 25% over the last 20 years or so, and that's counted as a source of water. Kind of interesting. Um, so our first aqueduct was the Los Angeles Aqueduct, and if any of you have seen the movie Chinatown, I don't know what the title is in, in Italian, um, great movie though, and it's about how water, the Los Angeles essentially stole didn't steal, but uh, bought the water rights from the from out from under the uh, the agricultural industry here in the Owens Valley in this region here, and the water is transported to Los Angeles, and that actually Los Angeles Department of Water and Power considers that a local source of water because it is actually LA land in some sense, even though it's outside of Los Angeles. We have the Colorado River, which is a very large basin here, um, that brings water essentially from the southern part of the river into less, uh, into more of uh, Orange County, central uh, Southern California. And we have the, the newest aqueduct, which is Colorado, the California Aqueduct, or part of, uh, some people re uh, refer to it as the State Water Project. It brings water from the Sacramento River Basin and the San Joaquin and Tulare River Basins there. So it's really the, the, the western Sierra Nevada. So the Sierra Nevada is here. There's a famous mountain range. Leaves. Uh, Yosemite, which I think you pronounce it, you'll say meat, I don't know exactly, um, <laughs> is in this region here. And uh, it, it, uh, all that water is drained by these rivers here and meets in the San Francisco Delta, the, the Bay Delta, and the water is transported into Southern California. Just a little bit on the, I put these together just for this talk so you can get a little bit of a um, background on these aqueducts. I, I find the history kind of pretty interesting. And this is the, our first aqueduct. It's only about 7% of our water um, in, in, in Southern California, and it's mostly for Los Angeles. It's about 0.5 cubic kilometers per year. Um, has, it's 674 kilometers lo uh, long. It's completely, um, it, it arrives to Los Angeles by gravity. So it's all by gravity. This is a famous Mono Lake, okay, and they used to, um, it's a very salty lake, but before the water got into the lake, they used to take the water before it entered the lake and bring it down to Los Angeles. I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, you can see again the, 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 the mountains from the eastern Sierra Nevada there that brings down the water into Los Angeles here. Um, so recently, in the last, I should say recently, uh, um, but probably the last 40 years or so, the, the water's slowly been um, reduced just due to legislation. And one is the uh, Mono Lake decision. Uh, Mono Lake was slowly being drained. So you can see this is a picture actually I took last year. And um, 
it uh, serves as an uh, ecosystem for many birds, migrating birds, nesting grounds, and things like that. So the lake is now um, being protected, and they had the Department of Water Power had to reduce its use by uh, you know, a significant percentage there. And we also have a, there used to be a beautiful lake here called the Owens Lake. Um, if I bring the picture back. In here, there was the Owens Lake, which is now, if you see there, you can't read this, but it says Owens Dry Lake, okay? So it was a dry lake because of the aqueduct. And what was happening is that big dust storms would occur, and the PM10 dust um, would get picked up and cause, actually, it's the largest source of dust pollution in the United States. So now, a certain amount of this, the water, so uh, as you may know, that uh, some of this, these dusts are actually pose health uh, risks for, for humans. And so now the Department of Water Power has a big mitigation program just to um, add some water to the lake to make it more like a, it's more like a wetland, if, it, if anything. And they um, have now they're uh, wetting the, the soils there so they don't get picked up in dust storms. Well, then came the uh, California River Aqueduct, and that was in the 30s. So the, the LA Aqueduct was, I think, around 1913 <coughs> or so. Colorado River Aqueduct which pulls water from the Colorado River Basin, obviously, um, from Parker Dam here all the way across to Los Angeles. This is a pumping station out of the, the, uh, the reservoir here. And this is a, a picture of the aqueduct as it moves, winds across the desert. It's uh, about 20 million cubic kilometers, and uh, I you know, did a calculation, but it's almost three IDJ rivers. So it's a fairly sizable river. I think the IDJ is the second largest in Italy, I think second to the pole, if I'm not mistaken. Serves about uh, 30 million people across seven states, so seven states uh, of the United States, and that's you know, about 30 million people. I think the population of Italy is about 60 million or something. Um, California allocation, so uh, US, California does not get all of the water. Um, we have an accord, an agreement, that says that we get about 5.4 cubic kilometers per year. Um, Adjustment here. The, uh, we have uh, it serves various irrigation districts in California, but we have the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which owns and uh, sort of owns and operates the aqueduct, and they supply about 55. So I didn't make the conversion into cubic kilometers, but 55 cubic meters per second, um, and it's uh, 389 kilometers. Five pumping stations, about 492 meters of lift across the system to get it to, to Los Angeles. Uh, one of the biggest issues here, though, with the, the Colorado River is that they, when they did the estimates back in the, uh, I think in the 20s, of how, how much water was in the river, they had, a very short, they had a very short time record, okay? And so it happened to be a very wet part of the, uh, the, the, the flows in the river were very wet during that time, so they over-allocated the water by about five, uh, five cubic kilometers per year. And so that's, you know, a good 20% of the uh, overall flow. Um, so that wasn't a problem for Southern California until recently when populations in, say, Phoenix, um, in Nevada, uh, started rising and they started to use their allocation of the water before uh, Los Angeles could use the water, any excess water that Los Angeles was allowed to use. Now there's less and less of the excess water, so we're having problems there. Um, that we've had some problems arising there. The last aqueduct is the State Water Project. Again, it's about 30%. It's our most recent aqueduct. In fact, the mayor's father was really sort of the, um, um, the had the vision to put this in. So Los Angeles mayor's father had the vision to put this aqueduct in. And uh, it originates, as we talked about, in the uh, Sacramento River Basin and the San Joaquin River Basin. And it comes out from the uh, San Francisco Bay Delta here. And it just transports, moves all the way down into Los Angeles. And this aqueduct also supplies a lot of water for the uh, agriculture in the uh, Central Valley of the United States. It supports about 25 million people on a $36 billion agricultural industry. This is also managed by the Metropolitan Water Districts. And just to give you some stats on it, about uh, 2.4 kilo, uh, cubic kilometers per year, 489 kilometers, six pumping plants, and about 988 meters of lift. Now we have some big modern issues here. So we have going through this drought, the aqueduct was shut down. And the reason was, one of the main reasons for this is we have a, the Delta smelt. 
Africa, which is a little tiny fish. Uh, the fish grows about five centimeters. My, my mother-in-law makes um, this, these little fried fish. I think she calls them skuma di mare. I don't know if, uh, if it's a dialect from um, Lecce, but it's, uh, uh, I think maybe, um, Yanketi, is that okay? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, okay. Um, but they're, they're basically like the little anchovies or, you know, something like that, line that, that size that she, you know, she fries them. Um, but they're also, they're very, in the delta, they're, they're very important indicator uh, species for the ecosystem, and they're uh, very important to the ecosystem there. So they're protected under what we have, we have something called the Endangered Species Act, um, which protects these, these little fish there. And so when, uh, what happens with these, when we're pumping the water down, the flows in the delta here get reversed and the fish get confused, they end up going through the aqueduct and dying. Um, so when water levels are low, we cannot use the water from the Colorado River aqueduct. Okay. I'm sorry, from the California aqueduct. And lastly, local supplies, which I already mentioned, but we have groundwater, which includes stormwater capture, so we do have some fairly advanced stormwater capture systems in there to infiltrate water into the ground. Uh, our recycled water has been uh, coming, becoming more and more important in, in the region in the last 20, 30 years, and uh, conservation has been very important. Um, I think we were at something like 600 liters a day, down to, maybe we were down to 400 liters a day, something like that. The, um, 450 maybe. Uh, desalination, which is another source that sometimes comes on the line when we have uh, drought situations, mostly in San Diego, but we also have one in Santa Barbara. So the overall objectives of the study are really to see if climate change will significantly modify the hydrologic cycle in, in the uh, western United States. And really, uh, I guess what we're trying to really address is will it influence the imported supplies of water such that it leaves uh, Southern California in extended periods of water shortage. And ultimately, we want to address other long-term long plans for expansion of local supplies adequate enough to meet any deficit brought on by climate change. Just a little bit about climate change. I think most of you, you know, know about it, and um, I don't need this overview, but I think most of you understand that greenhouse gas concentrations have been increasing in the in the atmosphere over the last 150 years, especially in the last 50 years or so. Um, this is just a time series of the three main greenhouse gases from uh, 0 AD to, to present, which is 2014. And we've had uh, you know, very substantial increases in all of these greenhouse gases. Most of the increases have occurred in the last 50 years or so. And this has, uh, as most uh, sorry, experts in the topic, uh, suggests that this increase in temperature we see is due to the cause of the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And this is just a time series from 1880 to present, um, looking at our, um, uh, basically if the, if the dot is above the line, it means it was warmer than normal year globally, and if it's below the line, it's a colder than normal year. And we see 2015 and 16 were the two uh, warmest years on record, um, partially due to the El Nino conditions. And just, you know, I counted up, say, the, the last, I counted up 19 years in a row, and 17 of them were the, the warmest year. Um, so the 17 of the last, of the warmest years have occurred in the last 19 years. And um, I think before most of you were born, 1976 was the, uh, the last colder than normal year, globally speaking. Um, just to look at this from a global perspective, the, the data are pretty coarse here, so it's hard to kind of say something about in the, uh, the Dolomites or even in the western U.S. But um, we can see that the trends are, are pretty much globally uh, warm, warming almost everywhere, except for perhaps where the thermohalic circulation is there, and uh, some cooling holes in the southeastern uh, United States there as well. And temperatures in the western U.S., it's really not shown well in this map, but have, are, have increased by about one to two degrees. Um, at least in, there in our mountainous regions, which is well above the global average. I think you probably see the same thing, I'm not sure, but in the, in the Dolomites as well, due to the snow, snow uh, albedo effects there. Okay, so what we want to do, what we had to do in the study was use a model, we call it a climate model, and a climate model to make projections about the future. And uh, I think not everybody probably knows what a climate model is, so I put this slide in here, but essentially what a climate model does is it uh, breaks up the, the globe into a bunch of grid boxes. Okay, you can see these boxes here. In each one of these boxes, the main 
sort of physical processes or dynamical and physical processes are re uh, represented in each one of those boxes there. Um, for example, in the atmosphere, you have advection, diffusion, cloud formation, radiation transfer, and things like that. At the surface, we have things like the biosphere, ice and snow formation, uh, infiltration into the, uh, the unsaturated zone, and runoff generation, and things like that. Um, this, for example, is just a picture of cloud cover from the NASA GCM Global Climate Model, and uh, it was showing Hurricane Ivan hitting the Gulf Coast. I'm just showing here cloud cover. So these these models are very very advanced and very very sophisticated. Um, they do um, they, they we use them for a variety of uh, uh, purposes, and I happen to use it for for a lot of things. Like I use it for climate change. So my main area is climate change, but I also look at land cover change. I've used them to uh, couple them with a with 3D uh, lake models that look at uh, the Great Lakes um, in, in the Great Lakes in the United States and simulating the 3D processes in there. Um, dust storms, things like that. Lots of things you can um, use them for. I kind of, you know, to me they're fun to use. You just, it's sort of like a video game and I, I teach a class on climate change and uh, every year I have an assignment for students uh, to run uh, this NASA educational GM and they, um, there's always a group of them that try one, their, their goal is to really destroy Earth. You know, so they'll deforest it, remove mountains, or you know, try to um, make the greenhouse gases so high that no one can survive and things like that. So, it's, you know, so they almost see it as a video game as well. How good are these models? Okay, this is a very important plot from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it's uh, a little tricky to understand, but basically the black line are observations in this case, uh, let's just use land and uh, let's use land surface. So these are observations over the land surface, the black line, and this sort of cloud of pink there. That's the, sort of all the main global models, and um, in their representation of different two different versions of climate. Okay, so uh, in this first area is, is these pink areas with the mo the models are changing the greenhouse gas concentrations to as to observations, and you can see that they capture, at, a, at least at a global scale, they capture the observations quite well. And when they leave the greenhouse gas concentrations at pre-industrial values, they don't simulate a trend, an increasing trend in temperature. So there's a few things to take from this plot, and I'll show you a little more detail in a second. A few things to take is one is the models actually do a pretty good job of simulating past climate. At least if you take their ensemble average or the average of them all. And two is they cannot simulate past climate without changing the greenhouse gas concentrations. Okay, so those are very two very important points in the model. And they show this, they zoom in at a regional scale, so we can look at say um, North America, they do a pretty good job there, and Europe, same thing. Okay. Um, so I put this cartoon in there. And uh, this is, you know, typical. In fact, I, you know, I had this thought at times. You know, we can't get these 24 young know, Italy here, and they, they say it's sunny outside. And I know uh, right now there's a storm hitting. Like yesterday they had a thunderstorm, and uh, at least uh, where I was, and it wasn't forecasted. And uh, so you can't get the 24-hour forecast right. How do you expect us to talk about the 100-year forecast? And I, I like this analogy from Richard Somerville from Scripps, and he said basically it's impossible to predict the age at which someone will die. However, we can say with very high confidence that the average age of death in industrialized nations is about 75. So one is more like weather when you predict the days of someone's death, and then the, the average age of death is more like a climate uh, issue there. And uh, I also like this quote, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, and um, so hopefully these models are useful um, and have some utility to them. Okay, so, the question though is that we, we're trying to make some projections about climate change, but we don't know what we're gonna do in the future. Okay, so this is just carbon dioxide levels over the last 800,000 years from ice cores, and we're, here's our current level. So we're at you know, natural levels around 280, our current levels are I think 406, something like that, right now 405. And, um, but we don't know what we'll do in the future. Will we stay down here as our agree recent agreement in Paris, or will we uh, do more of something like a business as usual? Business as usual it would be something around like 950 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
current uh, Paris Agreement, say without the ratcheting down to uh, two degrees or one and a half degrees, it's somewhere in the you know just under 700 range. And if we go to the full pledge, um, the hope for pledge, I, I call it two degrees. I think that the 1.5 is a little bit um, uh, very optimistic, but it would be nice if that were the case. But say the, the best case scenario I see would be something just under 500 parts per million. Um, as, as you know, the, the U.S. is pulling out of the agreement as, as it stands now, so that's about um, that's a significant chunk above there. So what we do is uh, we run each of these scenarios. Okay, so I run a business as usual scenario, or I run and also a mitigation scenario, and I might run something in between as well. Okay, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a projections for policymakers. So this study was really uh, targeting policymakers and decision makers. So we're, we're doing projections out to 2050. But it turns out there's very little difference between these scenarios at 2050, uh, uh, whether we go through mitigation or um, business as usual. But you could think of this if you're going to 2100, going out further. Okay, so this is our, uh, our models again. So a historical climate there and our projections. Um, this is our range of projections. Okay? Very difficult for a policymaker to make a decision here. We have something like one degree warming, or um, say five degrees of warming. Okay? Big, big difference and okay? major differences. Okay? This, most of the spread, though, is caused by the policy decisions we make. Okay, so we have our business as usual. Say something somewhere in the three to five degree range or so, um, and we have our sort of Paris level mitigation which would give us somewhere in the one to three degree range there. Okay, so our really our trajectories there. Um, so this would be sort of a policy related. Uh, a lot of the uncertainty is just from the policy and some of the uncertainty is from the spread between the models. Okay. Uh, again, we're focusing on 2050. You see there's only you know about a uh, half a degree difference between the two of 2050. So, um, so in this study, we're not too concerned about business as usual versus mitigation. And the uh, projections um, are about double over land. This is a side note. So um, you know, these are global averages. 70% of the Earth is covered in the ocean, as, as you know. So the, the warming is about double over land. So you can think of this as like 2 to 10 degrees over, over the uh, land surface. And I think if we raise temperature today by 10 degrees, we'd all be miserable now. But some of us might be happy if this were in the wintertime, unless you're like, snowboarding or ski fans. Um, but I think that's you know, quite significant. A couple of degrees is not, uh, not a major thing, but when we're talking about 10 degrees, that's a huge, huge, five degrees, 10 degrees, that's a huge amount of change to our ecosystems and, and even to our, our societies. And so my main area is really to take these models and then look at different impacts, okay? So these models are very coarse resolution. They give us a very broad general picture of what's going on, sort of at a regional scale, maybe European level scale. Uh, you could say something about Southern Europe, Northern Europe, something like that, but it's very difficult to say something about what's going to happen in, in Trento or in, in um, Puglia or something. Um, and so we can look at impacts on health. So quite a few studies been recently doing on human health and heat waves and stress, agricultural impacts. impacts. We can see how uh, crop patterns shift. There's a study uh, about 10 years ago now where we looked at wine production in the U.S. and saw a big shift in the wine production north and up the mountain. And so I think that's very relevant to here and what would happen to wine with five degrees warming, something like that. Um, forest impacts, so um, a lot of, uh, you know, if, there's, if we have more droughts, you know, your, your trees may be going under stress, you might have pests that come in. We have this big problem in the, in the western United States called the bark beetle. Bark beetle dies off in the wintertime because it gets cold, but it hasn't been getting cold, so now the bark beetle survives, and they kill the trees, and uh, all the pine trees, pine trees are now yellow there, and they become a fire risk. So, uh, and then what happens to these tr trees die, and then other trees, like the aspen tree in this case, move in, and it reduces our biodiversity and things like that. Water resources impacts, okay, obviously that's one of the areas that we're looking at today. Uh, impacts on coastal, so we you know, work on um, uh, estuaries and wetlands, wetland systems, and then you're going to get, say, uh, biology and things like that as well. 
Okay, but that's, so we have these models that are running at about a 100, 200 uh, degree resolution. Can't really say much about, um, say, the Alps region or something like that. But we need to regionalize these projections. And when we use our um, regional climate, one way to do this is using a regional climate model. And this happens to be my expertise. And um, what you do is you take a particular region, we're focusing on the US here, and you zoom into it, okay? And you can see, any, anybody knows anything about the topography of the US, uh, knows that, that the Rocky Mountains here are this one smooth range here. We also have some of these mountains here in Nevada, which aren't really uh, represented there. And that's how the GCM, or the global model, sees the world in a very smooth picture of things. What we then do is we nest in another climate model within the climate model. It's called the regional climate model. Basically the same physics and dynamics going on there, you just nested in. And the, the global model at the boundaries drives the regional model. Okay, so you can see now it's a little bit hard to see on this projector, but you can see that there, there's pretty complex topography there that's represented. And even the, the, the Great Lakes, um, in most, there's only two of the global models that actually represent the Great Lakes here, and these are massive lakes that uh, I think that aren't even represented in the global model, but of course the, the regional model represents these. And so the boundary conditions are, are in, obtained from the global model, and the whole purpose is really to enhance the information coming from the global model by regionalizing it down to, say, 10 kilometer resolution, 20 kilometer res resolution, or even 50 kilometers. Okay. Then we can say something about impacts on human health, agriculture, um, all those other impacts that we mentioned before. Okay, so let's get to this study. Um, what we did is we took 10 atmospheric ocean global climate models or general circulation models, and we nested them, nested a regional climate, climate model within them. And you can see that the 10 are listed there. We used uh, regional, uh, the ICTD, which is International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. It's a, uh, the regional climate model version four. We ran that at 16 kilometers, so this was coming out at say hundreds of kilometers, one to 200 kilometers, more like 150, 200, 250, and then we regionalized it to 16 kilometers, okay, which now gives us uh, much better information. By the way, we used two different scenarios. We used the historical greenhouse gas concentrations from 19, we actually ran in 1965 to 2005, and then instead of just taking the last 30 years of the simulation, and then we were a future scenario, which had, um, about the, according to the IPCC, IPCC, the future started in 2010, and we ran that till 2050, but again, we're using the last 30 years, this is what the policy makers are interested in. Then we took that, the output from the high resolution climate model, it was a very high resolution for a climate model perspective, at least at this, in this type of simulation, and we drove a hydrologic model, a hydrologic model is called VIC, variable infiltration capacity. Um, I think some of you have heard of that. And to get to you, we took the output from the regional model to drive the, the uh, hydrologic model. And that was bias corrected, really using a statistical downscaling technique, um, bias correction technique to drive that model, which you know, has its issues. But we feel like with this hybrid approach that we're using is, is sort of the best of both worlds. We're able to dynamically downscale things to 60 kilometers, and then we do a, a statistical correction. Um, and then finally, we say what the impacts on our water resources, but we're also doing work on, say, tornado frequency, um, you know, coastal, even coastal upwelling for fisheries in, in California, a lot of different things you can even do with the uh, impacts there. These were simulated, so just to give you an idea of how complex these models are. They were simulated, it took about a year on uh, Titan, which is the uh, second fastest uh, supercomputer in the United States. This is the first, it's the second fastest in the world, the fastest in the United States. Okay. And today, at least we believe, maybe there's somebody else that differs, but we believe that this is the most comprehensive and highest resolution assess, assessment um, available for the entire United States. A little bit about the hydrologic model verification. Uh, this was in an area that I was involved in, but uh, this is the topography of the U.S. here. Um, we have this hybrid approach for downscaling, and we have the calibrations, of just to show uh, calibration for the USGS observed runoff and uh, the, the validation period. And you can see that our values are 96.9 and uh, 96.5. So 
fairly good. Uh, you know, I think we'd like to see a little less spread there, but you know, this is a global, this is a continental scale model that we're using, and we're not focusing on one single basin like the Audi gene or something like that. Okay, so what do the uh, these simulations tell us um, about water resources? Well, let's start with the, the first order effect: greenhouse gas concentrations uh, increase, we expect temperatures to increase. We're focusing on the basins of interest again. This is the Colorado River Basin, which supplies water to the Southern California. And then our San Sacramento and San Joaquin Basin, as well as our local supply in our Owens Valley. Okay? And I've divided up the results in, in, uh, for each of those basins in, in general. Um, but we see that temperatures, on, in addition to the, uh, the one to two degrees that we've seen, we see another one to two degrees higher by, by mid-century, by 20, 2050, okay? which again is higher than the global average. Why? Okay, so where, where do we see the biggest changes here? We see them in these, uh, these, these red areas are the largest changes, and we can see them that those are the areas with the largest changes in snowpack. Okay. This is expected as a snow albedo effect. We change the reflectance of the surface. We change from a white surface. White surface reflects a lot of the sun's energy. We remove the snow. It's now a darker surface. It absorbs a lot of the sun's energy and then causes more warming, which causes more snow to melt, which causes more warming, and so on. Positive feedback is called in, in, uh, in our world. And when we look at snow depth, we can see up to about 75% decrease in, uh, in uh, snow depth. Okay. What does that do for precipitation? So we increase the temperatures. Good news from the precipitation uh, front, we see increases. Uh, Across most of the, uh, the basins for in precipitation, um, we use ten models here, so I can show you the results for all ten models. This is the average of the ten models here. This is what they say, but we can get an idea of the variability. One model says we have a couple models saying it's going to get drier, ten percent drier even. Okay, other models say it's going to get twenty percent wetter for different basins. By the way, each one of these bars is a different one of those basins since you know. I don't expect you to know the geography real well, but you can just think of these different basins as different bar there. Ensemble averages here. Ensemble average is something in a, around a 4% increase in all of the basins in precipitation. But again, with considerable variability. Previous studies, say studies that I was involved in 10 years ago, we used one model. If we had chosen this model, we would have made this paper, or maybe would have gotten into a big journal and say drying. If we had used this model, used that model, we might have said, might have said wetting. Okay, so now we can, with this approach of 10 different models, we can get some uh, feeling for the variability here. Um, this is looking at, a, uh, at um, season, precipitation seasonality. Okay, just basically, we get our, most of our precipitation in the winter time. And the fact that we see more red here means that the seasonality is increasing or that we get more precipitation in the winter time. So our increases are not occurring, say, in the summertime, which would be nice. They're occurring during the wettest part of the year. Okay? During the part of the year, the year when our reservoirs are in flood control mode, when our reservoirs are lowered down for flood control purposes. Evapotranspiration, okay? We had a discussion about transpiration or evaporation over lunch, and these models don't do all that good of a job of uh, measuring evapotranspiration. But this is coming from, from Vic, so it should be a little better that's coming out of the models. But they generally, I think all of the models generally um, predict a, an increase in uh, transpiration across the domain. What does that mean? It, it means um, most likely higher irrigation demands, as well as increased losses from our reservoirs. If we look at how that translates, we have the precipitation, we have evaporation, how does that translate into runoff? Okay. And we see here that again, uh, the in this case, the precipitation sort of wins out over the Evaporation, and we have uh, slight increases in runoff. Okay. So, all sort of at an at annual scale, we're seeing good news here. When we think of seasonality it, it, uh, and also partitioning of precipitation, we have different, different results there. Um, generally speaking, across the basins, we have uh, an increase of what should be red, 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 basically no change up to about a 9% increase in, the, uh, um, in runoff. And again, quite a bit of variability. A lot of uncertainty in these projections of runoff. Okay, so let's look at timing of runoff. This is looking at mid flow date. So, again, our water year starts October 1st and September 30th. This just says when does half of the water for the year arrive at a particular grid point? Okay, so um, 
felt mid flow date, but we also looked at spring pulse when 25% of the water arrived, and also the, uh, the, the recession, which was when 75% of the water arrived. And we see pretty much the same results in our mountainous regions where, um, where we're most concerned about there's a, a earlier stream flow. So the stream flow arrives a little earlier. Okay. Using a main candle uh, test, we see the red bars just mean significance, but you see these being a, bars being higher positive means a, an increase in that particular month and a decrease in that month. So we see in the springtime, earlier runoff, and in the summertime, later runoff. So less runoff in the summer, more runoff in the springtime. So a shift from summer to more in the spring. So in the fall? The fall, not much of a change over most of the basins. It happens to be a dry, very dry period of the year. So any change may be large, but there's very little difference there. So most of our, our, our runoff or stream flow comes by the by the end of the summer, and our, our rivers are very dry in the, in the fall. Um, and this, this is really a signal of snowpack. Okay, so what's going on here? We're melting our snow. More of our precipitation is falling as rainfall. Okay, so it goes directly into the reservoirs or artificial reservoirs. Doesn't stay in our natural snowpack reservoirs. The other thing is, what snow is there melts earlier. Okay, um, so more precipitation falls as rainfall, and snow melts earlier. I just said that. And uh, so we have less of this natural storage in the mountains, less of the snowpack storm doing a, a sort of ecosystem service for us. It's, it's holding the water back for us when we, or when we need it. And so there's really issues going to arise from our reservoir um, and management standpoints. Okay. And as I mentioned before, winter water levels are kept low for flood control purposes, and that's in conflict with our storage needs. Now if we're getting our runoff, our, our water earlier, we want to store that water but we had to lower the reservoir for flood control, so we, we lose that water. That water ends up being uh, wasted from a human standpoint. Okay, let's look at um, extreme years. So we just went through a major drought, um, and so let's see what, what happens if we have more very wet years or very dry years. And this is using a concept called the reverse return period. So we have like the present 50-year event, okay? And what is that, the present 50 year event, the event that occurs on average once every 50 years or once every 100 years, once every 25 years, what does that event become in the future? So maybe the 50 year event, in this case, so the 50 year event for the Colorado River becomes a 14 year event in the future. Okay. Much more frequent. And this is, by the way, this is not a daily flood event. This is the, the cumulative flow over the entire year. So do we have just a wet year or a dry year? Okay. So from a water resources standpoint, we're interested in summing up all that water and distributing it. Do we have more of these wet years? Yes, that's very good news. Okay, so we have very extreme wet years like we just had in California um, last this past winter. Okay. What about in the drier years? Um, so if we sum up the water again, we see now we also have an increase in drier years. Okay, so except for the mono, the small basin here, the Owens Valley. Los Angeles Aqueduct Basin, we see an increase in the frequency of drier years as well. So we have an increase in very wet years, an increase in very dry years, so a reduction in normal years, essentially. So, um, from the, if you think of this from a water resource management standpoint, this is a terrible scenario because we want reliability, we want certainty. Right? But uh, this means that you have a bimodality? In the no, you have a flattening of the, the PDF. So uh -huh. is, let's, let's say it looks like that. You, widen it, so you have your tails get bigger and the, the center becomes smaller. So basically the standard deviation is going up, the variance is increasing. <coughs> and if we looked at the mean, the mean would have a shift towards yeah. wetter in this case. So yes, less, less normal years, less reliability. Okay. Now at a daily scale, we're also interested in very large events. Okay, so a lot of these large events we have to pass through the reservoirs for flood, flood control. Um, at a daily scale, we look at daily maximum runoff, um, and we see that the reverse return period uh, becomes two, the, the events become, the 50 year event becomes about two to 10 times more frequent. And that's the same for the 10 year event, 25 year event, the 100 year event, no matter how we look at it, we see that the, uh, the return periods become more frequent for these extreme precipitation or runoff events. Um, 
we look at that in terms of runoff volume, we can see increases there. But I just wanted to highlight there is that we have uh, this urban setting where we don't have much, didn't come out. Uh, this urban setting where we don't have much snowpack. We do have snow in Los Angeles in the mountains uh, very nearby. It's only uh, maybe an hour drive, depending on where you live, two hour drive. Um, so we do have quite a bit of snow there. But this is all a very urbanized area there. We're increasing our flood frequency by two to 10 times, uh, more than five to 10 times in, this, in the Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego basins. So that really poses issues for our uh, channel. Uh, we have flood control channels, concrete channels. What their goal is is to move water out of the basin as fast as they can into the ocean. And it's sort of an old school way of thinking about things. But now there are all these measures to counteract this, to infiltrate water at the urban scale, and these are called best management practices or, or low impact developments, where we basically, every development has to capture the first, to do a conversion, about two centimeters of, uh, of rainfall that occurs on the property, has to go in, in, be infiltrated in, in, into the ground and either detained or retained. Um, so detained for a couple of days or retained and just never exits the, the property. So there are a lot of mitigation measure, measures to come up with uh, ways to, uh, um, increase our infiltration so we reduce the amount of water going into the ocean. We also improve water quality at the same time. So that those are some of the measures that are being implemented there. So that's sort of, um, and that was sort of the, the master student's thesis of my student. Now she's continuing the work a bit, and she just, these are just hot off the press. I mean, uh, um, I think maybe you probably haven't heard about these, but we have these atmospheric rivers, which are cause a large percentage of our precipitation in, in California. I think it's somewhere in the order of 70, 80 percent. So we were looking at from these simulations, do we have more atmospheric rivers? And this is just this, the atmospheric rivers, these large rivers essentially in the sky that transport moisture to California, Oregon, and Washington. And this is just for the water year 2017 through March 31st and all the atmospheric rivers that hit, and we had a huge amount of atmospheric rivers which weren't projected. You know, Usually we get the atmospheric rivers during El Nino year, we weren't in an El Nino phase, and we've got all these atmospheric rivers hitting, hitting in California that uh, increased our snowpack and did great things for water resources. So we decided to look, based on the, that particular year, what was happening with the atmospheric rivers. And this was very complex analysis, it seems very simple figure out how to track these, but uh, she spent a lot of time just trying to get, get these tracked correctly and make sure you're hitting an atmospheric river and not some big frontal system. Um, and we see that atmospheric river frequencies, the blue is, um, is the baseline, the historical simulation, the, the red is sort of the future, and um, the non-overlap is this lighter red, so you can see that there's a shift of the PDF towards a higher frequency of atmospheric rivers in the future. However, uh, their magnitude the size of these doesn't change much. So we just get more atmospheric rivers, but their magnitude stays similar. And these are very important for our water resources. Okay. Um, also, we see a, a larger fraction of precipitation falling as heavy precipitation. So um, combine that. So just to look at um, our future water cycle. Um, so I went back to that, coming back to the picture from the beginning what happens to precipitation and runoff and, and demand. Um, kind of using this slide here, we have substantial reductions in snowfall and snowpack. Okay, and what does that do? Well, that removes, as I showed that here, our snow line moving up the mountain a bit. And uh, earlier snow melts, that shifts our runoff curve, or stream flow, if you want to think of it that way, our runoff to earlier in the year, also increases it, okay? Increases our runoff there for a couple of reasons. One is that we have rainfall instead of uh, snowfall, and so we have a higher flood risk um, of rain floods. So we don't have the if, if it falls as snow, it doesn't flood until it melts at least. So if it's falling as rain, we have the potential to flood. And um, you can hear what I just said there. And a substantial uh, increase in extreme uh, storm frequency and intensity. Um, we do see an increase in the intensity events, but they're not associated with the atmospheric rivers. I'm sorry, with the uh, yeah, with the intensity but they're not associated with the uh, atmospheric rivers. Higher irrigation demands with our higher evapotranspiration. And we also have higher population, which I'll talk about some measures and how we handle this. Okay, higher population, which increases our demand curve there. 
and higher evaporative losses from our reservoirs, and essentially we have a lot of additional deficit if you want to do a difference in the integration. Not a, and not all of our um, infrastructure in California is currently suited to handle these changes, especially our reservoirs. Um, we had, this past year we had very uh, big issues with our reservoirs. We're dumping water. We're just coming out of a, a drought, and the year before, we were in the middle of a drought, and we had the reservoirs dumping water into the ocean because they had to be in flood control mode. Um, I won't go through that one, but let's just talk about, I think what's interesting to me is because this is a study that we really, uh, has generated a lot of interest from the our water agencies and energy agencies, and, um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, a different, what, what can we do about this? Okay, so we have population. Population in California and Southern California is projected to increase by about 25% um, over the, uh, uh, by about 2050, okay? Our current demand is about just under five cubic kilometers per year, and we use about 680 liters um, per day per capita. So me personally, again, this is not counting agriculture, you know, eating beef or whatever. This is just uh, just my municipal water use, okay? And the reason is because we all have our nice gardens, we call them um, yards, and, uh, and and grass, okay? Prato inglese, I think you might call it, I'm not sure. Okay, and uh, in Italy is, you know, um, 240 liters per day, so quite a big difference there, okay? Um, so just based on population demands, uh, population increases, we cannot, even if we implement conservation, things like that, uh, or any extra excess runoff, if we're able to capture all that extra water that we get, we cannot make up for population increases. So our, our demand will go up to about six, mil, six cubic kilometers per year. Okay. Outdoor irrigation, I mentioned that's how we uh, why we do a lot of uh, watering in our yards, but really uh, um, about 80% of the water in California, and I haven't mentioned this, 80% of the water in California is used for agriculture. We are the most agriculture, uh, agriculturally productive region in the world, I believe, and um, and you can see this, this is this is in the middle of the desert, okay? I mean, real desert, not sort of high desert, in the middle of the desert, this is a satellite image from uh, from NASA, the Salton Sea, which is formed by accident, but it's still there, and uh, the water from irrigation keeps this lake alive, but it's very polluted and contaminated now, and this is just a uh, community, I think it's like in Phoenix or something like that, um, in the middle of the desert, we have these nice yards, and lawns and things. And if you uh, were to irrigate this, so we have to water our, our yards, um, and we require about 1.3 meters a year of water. Um, evaporation, our, our demands are projected to increase, so you'd probably maybe instead of 1.3, maybe you need 1.4, 1.5 meters of water. And um, we do have additional precipitation projected, so that would provide irrigation water. But the problem is, is the timing of that. It's during the winter time when our irrigation demands are lower. So in the summertime, when we add most of the water to our lawns, we're not able to accommodate to that. Big programs we have, the Department of Water and Power will give you money to buy what's called a rain barrel. Okay, you take a barrel, and you have a downspout from your rooftop, and you fill the water, fill the barrel up with water, and then you can use it to irrigate your yard. Our fish and wildlife doesn't like it because mosquitoes can reproduce there, so they're not real happy about it, but it's not a whole lot of water. They're called their 55 gallon crumbs, which is about 200 liters, um, and they don't provide a whole lot of water if you if you do the math to get 1.3 meters into uh, um, over your area. What's been very effective, though, is our tier turf rebate programs. So we take Department of Los Angeles will give you, uh, the Water and Power in Los Angeles will give you Three dollars and seventy-five cents. Say three fifty euros. Three dollar. Three euros fifty cents per uh, square foot. Okay. To remove your lawn in the front in the front of your house. Okay, people, we just have these yards that are in the front of our house. They pay a lot of money, so a few thousand dollars to remove your front your lawn. Okay. People are taking advantage of that and putting in nice um, native uh, plants. Okay. Actually, I think it looks pretty nice, but people that have lived there many years hate them. So. Um, it's very uh, uh, controversial, but it's very effective for getting our water use down. Okay, when over 50% of the water in my household is going towards irrigation. I actually live in an apartment, so it doesn't matter. So I don't have much irrigation. 
But we also need efficient irrigation. So we're doing most of our sprinkler systems, like I see here in Italy, where we irrigate. They're spraying everywhere, and that's, that's get, uh, evaporating a lot of water, wasting a lot of water. Uh, if we do subsurface drips, so you can put subsurface drip systems in to our yards and things like that. Stormwater pap capture has been developed um, you know, in recent years. Um, the problem is, so we basically have these basins that will infiltrate water into the ground. So we have an area that's sort of sandy maybe that will infiltrate more water, and then we get that into our groundwater. A great, great idea. The problem is most of Los Angeles is urbanized, so we don't have much space for that. But they have been somewhat effective. And what we've done, and I'll talk about it in a future slide, is what we've done, we're actually infiltrating um, other water, though, our advanced treated water, our tertiary treated or our advanced treated wastewater, and putting that into the ground and, and storing that there. Um, in fact, here is groundwater storage. This happens to be a famous uh, spreading grounds or a stormwater capture area. We have storms that come in. They can be uh, spread out over this area and then infiltrated. We also have advanced treated water, tertiary treated water okay, that we can put there. But also, what if we have a really good year from a water resources perspective from our aqueducts, we can take that excess water and put it into the ground as well. So we're right now in Los Angeles doing these three measures, stormwater infiltration, uh, treated wastewater infiltration, and then imported water and recharging our aquifers. Which is actually a very good alternative because we could raise our reservoirs, right? Yes, we have thousands of reservoirs in California. We could raise them up and increase their capacity, right? And, but then we take away land. We can, all of, a lot of our groundwater basins have been depleted. We can now recharge water into those basins it's under the right conditions. Anyway. Okay, the recycled water. The skins are treated wastewater. Um, some countries actually drink this wastewater. They, we were all set to do it in the uh, United in, in Los Angeles, but then, uh, um, of course, Beverly Hills wasn't going to receive the, the the water. It was in the poorer communities, and then, and then they, it became a social justice issue. And they called it toilet to tap. Okay, toilet to tap. Tap is like you know um, the sink, and so it got it, it was very got a very big negative sort of negative publicity and sort of killed it, but it's looking, it's gaining more momentum now. We have uh, treatment plants that actually treat the water so well that they actually have to add minerals to it. So they run it through membranes. It's so good that they have to add minerals to it to make it, it's bad for you to drink. They're, right now they're putting this into the ground. It has to stay in the ground for about a year and then you can bring it back out. And drink it. Um, the way I look at it is all our water has been recycled. You know, I think in the IDJ there's probably um, wastewater treatment plants that are putting into the, the river there, and then other people are drinking downstream, but I'm not sure who gets. Needs to be a bigger part of the uh, solution, and we can double this by 2035, so you think we can, I mean, get it quite a, a you know, not a closed system, but sort of nearly closed. We can't drink it, okay, there's no direct, we call that direct potable reuse, we can't drink it yet, so what are we using it for? We charge the groundwater, we're also using it for golf courses, okay, so irrigating major commercial golf courses and commercial buildings have uh, green space as well, they irrigate with it as well. My university uses the water to irrigate um, in there, uh, irrigate there as well. It doesn't have as much value and when you, when you um, by the way, when you, um, when you don't, when you have to have separate lines for it, I right know they're called purple pipelines, so we have purple pipe that distributes this water. So think of all the infrastructure, if you were to put this down every single street in Los Angeles, it would be very, very expensive. So really. If we could share the lines, that would be really the way to go. Our infrastructure, okay, we could raise our reservoirs, we could um, cover our aqueducts. You saw that aqueduct running through the middle of the desert, it's losing water, right? Um, I don't know if you've seen these pictures, they'd be, they're putting balls, big balls, inflatable balls into reservoirs right now, so that they reflect the energy back, in, uh, back out so that they, they um, don't evaporate water, whether it works or not, I'm not sure. Um, we also have a project called the uh, Two Tunnels, which is a very, very expensive project, but I talked about the Delta Smelt. Okay? We can't use the water from the, Colorado, the California aqueduct always. We're talking about putting a tunnel underneath the Delta. Okay? So the San Francisco Bay Delta, the Delta that with these tunnels, this is a big distance, put two tunnels underneath there to transport the water from the Sacramento River underneath the Delta into, the, into our pumping station. Very, very controversial, very, very expensive project. Okay? Maybe a last resort. Um, management. Um, 
This is just a case, a case from the, uh, Lake Mendocino and up north, Northern California, 2013. Our rule curve, so this is our reservoir operation, they have to maintain um, say below this dashed line. And in the winter, you can see that the, this, the rule curve is lowered for flood control. Okay, so this storm came in and they had to dump all the water out and no additional precipitation came later on. Our current operations, we don't use weather, for, our weather forecasts are quite good in the United States, or fairly good, um, but we don't use them very much for water resources management. And so they don't say, oh, there's a storm coming in five days, let's release some water, or let's, let's keep the water higher. Oh, there's a big storm coming, we can now release water, we have five days to release the water, so we can release the water, okay? We actually got into trouble with Lake Oroville, some of you might have seen this on the news, um, there was, they were trying to maybe perhaps better manage the water and um, it started overflowing on the spillways. Um, big thing that's going on now is we're paying farmers not to farm. Okay, I said 80% of the water in the state is going towards agriculture. Um, to get more urban water, people are just paying. Let the land fallow, fall, as he would say. Um, don't farm, we'll pay you for the water. So the water that's already subsidized, they're getting paid not to use and, um, um, and to transfer into urban settings, which is pretty successful in San Diego. In that area you saw from the satellite map. So they're, they're paying them not to farm as much. And let me uh, just show, where we're, we're taking the study now. I just thought this was very real. This is new results here. We're still working on the study. Um, uh, with the, the team at Waterloo and uh, Innsbruck and we're looking at what it also means for this, uh, these projections mean for the ski industry. And I thought that was pretty relevant to hear, even though there's an important ski industry here. And I'll just show a couple of slides on that. Um, but we have our temperature changes. So we have a continental scale, sort of uh, you know, the entire US for these projections. I've been focusing on the Western US. But we have our changes in temperature and precipitation. So generally, increasing precipitation, some drying in the Texas region there. and. Um, and change in annual snow coverage. Okay, we can see a reduction in snow coverage as well, and a change in our rain to uh, precipitation rate ratio. So we have more liquid or more rain over as opposed to snow. And what does that mean for our snow industry? Okay, so we could just look at a very sim simplistic point of view and say our snowpack decreases, snow industry has a problem. Okay, but they make snow. I don't know if they do it here, but we uh, in the U.S. a lot of artificial snow is made when, uh, when the temperatures are cold enough. You can we can make lots of snow. So we used a, a model called Ski Sim, okay, with our colleagues at Innsbruck and Waterloo. And it does things with that ski season length, operation during key and economic periods, say so uh, Christmas time is when we have our biggest, what's most important for them, snow making requirements, and our snow making costs. You can do a full economic analysis of this. And very, very new uh, results, so I'll just show, but basically we're seeing our markets change in length. The western U.S., which I think has our best snow, is um, a very light snow, um, decreases by, you know, from between 16 to 24 days in length, okay? So if you think of the ski season, maybe 100 days, 120 days, quite a bit. Um, but in the eastern U.S., very little change. A weak change, maybe, is somewhat substantial, but it's not nearly as much as, as changing by three weeks or so. Okay. Um, if we look at, say, the probability of operating on Christmas holidays, okay, uh, we see the present climate is the blue. So our Pacific Northwest, for example, or let's look at California, um, let's see Lake Tahoe um, or Mammoth, um, is a, about a 70% chance of operating on Christmas, while in the future about a 45% chance of operating. The Midwest regions, are close to 100, uh, Midwest, North, Northeast, and, and the, the Eastern US are close to 100%. So it's really, in a way, uh, winners and losers with this. this. This region really stands to, doesn't stand to change much the Eastern US, but the, the Western US really stands to lose quite a bit. Perhaps if we looked into Canada, maybe they would stand to benefit um, with more precipitation. And what's, okay, where does this come in? Well, how do we tie this to water resources? Well, a large percentage of that uh, snow can be, can, can be artificial. And you can see our, these are our changes in snow making requirements. So how much extra snow did they need to make to, to sustain these resources? You see very little change with these sort of light colored dots here and very dark colored dots here, which mean there are a lot of, uh, a, a 
large increase in the snow making requirements and really water becomes a key issue again there because we need to use our reservoir water uh, or river water to make snow out of it. Okay. Um, so this is the last slide, yep. This is the study. She won an award for this work. Um, the American Water Works Association Best Masters or something like that. Uh, that acknowledge her there, but um, that's my presentation. Thank you for attending. Questions? Observation, comments? Uh, yes, I, I, I can't believe that she get the prize because <laughs> This, this uh, can or can't? Yeah, the, this looks like a PhD thesis more than. Yeah, she did quite a bit of work, and she's still doing work on this. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, that we, in the atmospheric river, she's continuing that. It's really, um, um, you know, unfortunately we don't have a PhD program at LMU, but uh, so she's now at the University of Ghent in Belgium. She was originally at UCLA, but it wasn't working out there, so she just moved to uh, Belgium now. I have a more general question. So you observe several changes uh, at scale which are, let's say, larger with respect to the, the typical size uh, of, uh, of a catchment that is managed for water resources, at least uh, in, the, in the Alps. And, um, and uh, what you observe is based, is based on the climatic model mainly, uh, which are related to atmospheric dynamics, basically, less on the what happens in the, in the land, in particular in groundwater. Uh, since we observe here also changes, long-term changes, triggered by change in the, in the distribution of precipitation, in the, in the way in which the water resources are distributed, I'm wondering if, if you also investigate this in this Suspect, but in the current framework here, we, we do use a, the hydrologic model VIC now, which is probably too simple for what you're thinking. Um, but it's definitely from the atmospheric perspective, it's a step forward compared to just using, say, yeah, CLM. We have CLM was the uh, land surface model in here, uh, you know, which is um, one of the more advanced land surface models from the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. But to, um, to get groundwater, uh, we don't have that in the at least this version of it. Um, but I think from the hydrologic standpoint, we, we can say a lot more, we have a lot more confidence with this framework than we would have just taking straight output from the yeah. climate models. Yeah, no, I was saying that because uh, looking at the data here in the, in the RDJ catchment, we observed, uh, first we observed that there are, I mean, uh, quite, uh, complex uh, interplay between the users and, and change due, changes due yeah. to use the use of water and change due to climate change and right, right. in many cases it's very difficult to disentangle the yeah, yeah, the, good point. the the two yeah. the, the two yeah. uh, the two effects let's say second uh, th that was quite strange to me uh, at the beginning uh, we observe that, for instance, uh, here we tend to have more precipitation in fall. So the precipitation increased in fall. This is not a projection uh, by the by climate right, change, right, right. it's just observations in the past. Then we have more rainfall in, uh, in, in uh, fall, uh, which tend to increase the winter runoff because they are accumulated and then, and then uh, yeah. slowly released and the winter runoff is increasing despite the precipitation winter is reducing. Yeah, I guess what we see our, your, our, your situation is different than ours because we have a cold ocean, the Pacific Ocean is very cold right there. It yeah. doesn't provide a lot of moisture, but I assume your systems may be coming from the Mediterranean uh, basin, which is still warm at that time of year, which produces some perhaps an increase in thunderstorms, or perhaps it's not even climate change related. But yeah, that we don't have that, those fall storms because it's a dry time of year, so our, our, our ocean doesn't get much higher than 28, 122 degrees or so. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so no, but it was what it was saying is that uh, sometimes there are changes that can be captured by uh, by using models because uh, because there are these processes yeah. that are very there are processes that are very difficult to yeah. to reproduce in a, in a, in a model. Yeah, another thing is when you mentioned on yours that we, most of our basins of where you know where our, our snowpack is are not developed areas. I think you know the Dolomites are. Although there's only, you said, a half a million people in the region here, yeah. they're still fairly developed. So you're taking water from the, the system there where we don't, we are not taking water uh, from the system that high up. Oh, okay. Uh, which is kind of an interesting twist that, that this region, I think, brings. You, you know, having all the urbanization, the, the, uh, the, the users of the water as it's, as it's coming through. Yeah. One, one area that, you know, this, this, we stop at runoff, you know, at the grid point scale. So, we, you know, routing the water is going to be an important part of the study. We're trying to bring in WEEP, which is a water evaluation planning model, to do the water resources management for us. And it has the users of irrigation, um, urban urban users, and hydropower, and things like that, and it optimizes the, the system for that. Um, but at this stage, we, you know, we haven't taken it down to that level. But yet, I think that the added complexities, I think these this type of framework can be applied to a lot of different things, uh, you know, different areas of, of hydrology. And I don't think that um, you know, the fact that this system may be slightly more complex or different um, doesn't mean that it can't be applied. I think it's a very, these, these models, um, you know, they're, they're all wrong, like uh, you know, the box says, but uh, they, they certainly are can provide some use. And even if you don't get the, the users, the municipal users, agricultural users correct, you can still say, oh, well, there's more water coming at this time of year or less at that time of year. And then adding that those extra layers just makes the, the work even more um, yeah. you know, interesting, I think, or more useful. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the big model. So if, I, if I'm not wrong, you show the validation of the model based on annual uh, stream flow. Uh, and then you show the, uh, let's say, the uh, projections of uh, extreme events at seasonal, uh, at time scale. So I, I was wondering if you also validated the model at uh, a finer time scale, let's say monthly or seasonal. Uh, that wasn't the area I, I worked on that, but you know, I th it was. I think the bias correction was applied at the monthly time scale. The way we had another paper, and I didn't do the bias correction or the corrections in this. We had another other work that we did where we were about, we were we're actually doing sort of a smooth uh, uh, daily time scale. But it was really, let's call it a monthly time scale. So corrections were occurred, were done at that. I assume that they applied the same technique there, but I don't know for sure. I added this slide just for this particular presentation. I thought you might have questions about the, the correction, but I, don't, I can't say much about that. The, um, the, if you look at strictly precipitation, the, the results look very similar though. So uh, you know, the slide I originally had was precipitation event, daily precipitation event magnitude. And uh, that translates into the runoff. You know, sort of mm -hmm. And concerning the um, reservoir uh, operational rules, uh, uh, did you know the current operational rules and maintain it uh, also for the future? So those are not included at all in, this, okay. in the study at all. So that's that's one area. So what we're trying to do is bring in this water resources model. So that's where you know we're sort of coming from. The, you know, I have some training in, in hydrology, so my PhD is in that. But I, I come from things at the sort of the atmospheric side at the land surface, but I don't get into the water resource management or the hydrology so much. And one area that we're, we're adding now is to take the output from the model and to drive a water resources decision making model with rating curves and, uh, and everything in them. So that's that's one area we're, we're trying to move forward on, which I, I think will be very, very interesting um, with this, this particular model that we're trying to use. It's a little tricky to set up, because it's sort of like a point and click kind of model rather than uh, um, you, know, you have to use these CSV files instead of Graded, you know, binary files. So uh, the students are having a tough time working with it. Hopefully, we'll have something. Um, maybe I have a more um, philosophical question. Since uh, I mean, uh, I'm very general. I would say, uh, what you also are presenting is uh, the effect of anthropogenic drivers on climate change. But almost all these anthropogenic drivers are related to the increased population that. Uh, rise in the last century, basically. 
So uh, I wonder whether I mean climate scientists uh, should uh, I mean I I in the um, in the framework of political decisions that have to be taken or how politicians have to convince people to adapt uh, to climate change or to improve the condition if the problem of over overpopulation is somehow missing I mean somehow we, we should have, uh, let's say, a reduction of the population. You're, you're preaching to the choir. I, I, the, our problems are related to, to population, overpopulation. I yeah. completely agree with that. The, the problem is that it's a topic that people do not want to touch because to tell people that they shouldn't have more children is not a nice thing to do. China has done this, and people were complaining that that wasn't the right thing to do. One child policy, and now they've lifted, they've relaxed that policy for other reasons. But, um, you know, we. We aren't growing. In Italy, I think you even have a negative population uh, growth. We have, in the US, we're pretty stable, and our population growth is due to immigration, which I, I now, I'm sure that now you have, your growth might, you might actually have growth now with the, the refugee crisis happening here. But, um, you know, I don't know if, uh, if policymakers, you know, I would love to tell people to have less children, um, but <laughs> maybe that's the right word, wrong way to say it, but, um, you know, clearly that's our problem, but you know, how do we solve that? Uh, you know, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the past has been solved by wars. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or by disease, uh, yeah. floods. And <laughs> I mean, I think yeah, the social the scientists need to address this yeah. issue. It's very, very important. I mean, to yeah. me, it's, it is the number one issue, is it, but everybody ignores it. We dance around, the, we call it elephant in the room, and we ignore the elephant in the room. Um, <laughs> but. It's where we pretend that it doesn't exist, but it's really, um, you know, I just, my research is that, you know, if this happens, if we do this, then this might happen. Um, but I don't get into the, the policy and making mm -hmm. side of things, but, I, you know, I think it's extremely important. It just happens to be an area I don't really uh, dabble in very much. So. Maybe the social scientists over here have <laughs> So if there are no other questions, I think we we are done. And thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for having me. It was, yeah, uh, was quite interesting for me, and I, I think for everybody here. Good. Now if you want to, to do personal questions to him when <laughs> <laughs> he has time. More philosophical. <laughs>